Steven, thank you so much for coming on the AIM podcast. Happy to be here. Let's rock. Let's rock. This is going to be a really special episode, man. What you're building with Cuts, like many people listening to this episode I'm, are very familiar with the brand, is, is super special. And first, just want to say congrats to you and the team for what you guys are have already built and are continuing to build with the brand. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're, uh, like I mentioned before we got on the call, just getting started. We've, we've done a lot of... Uh, it's been an amazing journey, but we feel like, you know, we're in the phase two of cuts of, all right, you know, we were scrappy. We were this, you know, four guys just wanting to, you know, build a business. And now that we're here, now we want to build like a truly great operational household billion dollar brand. So we still feel like we're in inning one or two. Let's go. I'm excited to dive in. Before I do, I do have to bring up something that might make you a little upset. How, uh, how are you feeling about San Diego State, man? I thought they had it, bro. I, they were looking good. Yeah, I, w- I was actually at that game at the uh, end of it. Um, I was actually at the final. The f- it was one of the cooler sports moments, the cha- the game to go to the championship, just to uh, be like, oh, my goodness, we actually might. Why not us? Like, we actually might make a national championship. Uh, one of the cooler moments. And then I think we, we, it was it was 60-55 with 10 minutes to go. You know, at the beginning of the year, if you would have said you're – down five or 10 minutes to go in the championship game, you would have took it. So it was, it was a cool moment for all of the state alumni and current students. Uh, You know, we've had a good program for a while. So this was pretty cool, especially coach Detcher. Uh, His daughter was like, you know, we were in the same class at San Diego state and he's been such a legend for San Diego state in the shadows for him to finally get his uh, moment in the sun. I was, I was really happy for him. Do you send him a cuts package? Uh, I think we send her <laughs> daughter's husband packages or something like that. So. I love it, bro. That's but so- Matt Bradley on the team. He's, he gets a bunch of cuts, like a lot, some of the guys, Tramel, all those boys. I'm sure, man. That's so cool. So cool. But dude, I'm, I'm excited to dive in. There's already this great energy and the way you speak about cuts and the things you're doing. So I think it's going to be a great episode. But before we talk about cuts, this is super important. I think a lot of people enjoy hearing more of your background and your kind of story pre-cuts, because we have on founders on the show and it's cool to hear what they're building. But I think the context leading up to that is always super interesting just to kind of understand where your mind was at and, and some of the things that you were working on before you took the initiative to start cuts. Yeah. So when I was, uh, I graduated school in 2013 from San Diego State and, uh, you know, I thought I wanted to be like a marketing agency exec and our school had, re, uh, there's this agency called Lambesis Agency. It's actually featured in um, a couple of Malcolm Gladwell books. And so it had a good reputation of being like the agency in San Diego, like premier branding agency. Uh, I remember like when I got the job, everyone was like, oh my goodness, Stephen got an, a, a job there. Like that's hard, you know? And so I, I went in with a lot of pride, like this is what I wanted to do. But then like within like a week, I was like, shit. I do not want to be an agency guy. This is a, this is tough. So I, I think that job, but the job was really good for me to learn branding and they're, they're the best. They were the best at it in like the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, so I did learn that. And, and I, I met some amazing people, Chad Farmer, Nick Lambesis, Brian Munts, like Oscar Lutteroth, all those boys are like icons in the game. And to be able to learn from them firsthand was awesome. Uh, but it wasn't really something that I enjoyed doing. Um, and, uh, so I worked there for a year and then from there, when I was there, I started to, you know, get the itch of, you know, could I start my own e-commerce business at the time? My buddy was running movement watches. Uh, he was their uh, first employee, which was Blake Pinsker. And then I became friends with the CEO, Jake. And I was like, oh, maybe I could start an e-commerce business. So in 2016, after leaving that job and, uh, uh, you know, n- bouncing around to a couple jobs after that, I said, you know, I'm going to move home and I'm going to start cuts. And I got the idea actually from working at Lambesis. Everyone was wearing t-shirts and nice jeans. And I was like, oh, there's an opportunity here. Uh, you know, doing t-shirts. It's something that I love. I see the opportunity of, of a shirt that maybe isn't as uh, wrinkle. It's more wrinkle free. It still feels like an athletic shirt, but it, it's, it's, formal enough to wear to the office. Boom. There's our marketing. Let's go. So 2016, I moved home to start it. So cool, man. 
I love hearing the stories. What was it though that really got you to say, look, I'm just going to go in on this idea. Was there like a specific moment that you remember or was it just kind of a gradual thing that you just started to kind of get pulled in that direction? Well, I left a part off of that story. I got laid off from Lambesis. Okay. <laughs> talking to my dad and just having such a bad feeling um, about it and being like, I never want to be in the situation again where someone else has that ability to change my career and my livelihood. So I want to start my own job um, and, start, and have my, I, if the customer doesn't buy it, that will be why I don't have a job, but not because someone else is going to have that power. And I just didn't want to be 60 and someone say, Hey, I can get someone younger, cheaper. You're out. Um, I wanted to put that destination in my hands. And now there's so much more risk being a founder. You know, you could go bankrupt, your reputation's on the line. Uh, you, I'm, especially as the business gets bigger, you know, I'm a punching bag for, you know, certain things that happen, layoffs or whatever it may be. And that's, you know, I can take it, but I still think all of that is better than, you know, working hard for 30 years and then being, mm -hmm. being, you know, pulled the rug on because someone's younger. And and now as a, as a founder, I realize why they do that. Hey, it's just a more efficient, probably higher uh, than having someone older. So I, I just wanted to, I, I, I wanted to give entrepreneur a shot and I figured there's no better time when I'm 25. I have no, no debt, no risk, no girlfriend. There's, it's never going to be, it's always going to get harder from here. So let's give it a shot. Totally. That, that makes a ton of sense. Where did your relationship with the word ambition come into play? Like, is this something you always kind of consider yourself ambitious growing up? Obviously with the brand, you guys kind of, you know, market outfitting the most ambitious people. Was this something that you always kind of knew you wanted to do and, and kind of was a part of who you were? Or where did that kind of come into play? Yeah, you know, uh, with making clothing for the sport of business, which has always been the category, it's kind of hanging up here, but it's on one of our trademarks, uh, which is is really the ethos of the brand. We want to make clothing that's easy to wear, that makes you look professional, that isn't for the gym, but it has gym properties in it. It's a step above like the athleisure category uh, and a category that we want to define. Um, and so how do you, like who competes in the sport of business? It's very ambitious people. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's winners, people who want to make money and win people who want to build something and, and being in the sport of business can look like a lot of different, a lot of different ways in a lot of different careers. Uh, your ambition might just be to start a, a local coffee shop, make a hundred K a year and just, you know, have no boss. That's a great life. That's the sport of business. It could also be like, hey, you're going to climb the ladder at a law firm and you're going to be the best lawyer and you're going to represent the biggest people in the world. That's the sport of business. So it can look different, but the common theme amongst all of those different professions is, hey, you want you have ambition to be the best and that's what cuts is. So cool. No, I love that. I think it's cool how you just say like everyone can apply to themselves and different perspectives and how they're doing it. And that's that's been the big thing with this show. It's been cool to have on ambition of mine this, this kind of goes nicely with what you guys stand for but just having on people that have ambition and showcasing how they apply ambition to whatever they're working on so i think it's cool how you guys kind of you know model that same approach definitely i want to talk about the early days because i think this is yeah. something that everyone can look at the brand now and, and see where you guys are and see just a quick snapshot and see all the success and the people wearing the brand but there was a lot of work, consistent days put in to get to the point we are at now. And I know you guys have, you know, goals moving forward. What did some of those early days look like starting the brand and, and maybe share some challenges or things you learned throughout the process there? Say the early days, the biggest challenge was like mental because I was, I was moved home and I was 25, no girlfriend. You know, I lived in San Diego alone. I was living a the life there, living in Pacific beach. It was awesome to move home to a small town, you know, kind of put my life on pause and really focus on the business. You know, it was very scary. I was going to, I didn't want to be that kid that moved home to start a t-shirt brand that wasn't successful. So in the early days, I was really like, kind of like I lacked, I thought I had more confidence than I had. Um, but through the entrepreneurship, and I always say this entrepreneurship can give you, and, and it really teaches you how to have confidence because no one's going to believe in you. You have to find that within and you have to be willing to tell your mom, your sister, your friends, like I got this and they're not going to believe you at first. So it's, it really is builds that confidence muscle. Um, unlike many things and it, it and it's made, it, it has made me much more, uh, well-rounded because of it. Um, and so I think that was like the biggest challenge like is just building myself confidence to be able to like 
have thick skin when things got tough. And like, you know, we, we had fabric stolen from us. You know, we had a million things go wrong. We had the UPC is not on the right. We're uh, not right. So it messed up all the orders. Everyone got diff- the wrong items. We've had, you know, we, we shot by cut and the split hem had the elongated tag sizings off. I mean, pretty much everything under the sun in the early, early days, the Henley was crooked. I mean, it, it felt like every week there was something um, wrong. And I, I think through that, it, it also give, it also, I, I, one of the things I learned was context. You know, when in the early days, let's say a hundred pieces got messed up out of a thousand and you're like, oh my goodness, that's 10%. But if you could kind of look further and say, that's 10% of the orders now. Um, but like cuts, we've done millions of, we've sold to millions of customers now. A wow. hundred is like nothing. And, and granted, I don't want to make it sound like we don't pay attention to every order, but sure. things in business aren't going to go your way. And if you look at everything like the end of the world, you're going to, you're going to have a heart attack. The show will go on. And the best thing you can do for customers is just admit the mistake, make it right um, and move on. And so I think, you know, through those early, early mistakes, it was really good having messing up on a small scale. So we can avoid those mistakes on mis- messing up on a big scale like we do now. Um, I'm trying to think what were some other challenges too. Um, That's super valuable though. That makes a ton of sense. What, um, yeah, that's awesome. What I'm curious your take on this. You talk about just, you have to have confidence, you know, entrepreneurship is a great way to really kind of test your confidence and kind of figure out what you're made of. I asked this on another episode with, with someone else. Do you think confidence is something that you choose or do you think it's something that you have to earn and work for? Uh, I think confidence can come from a lot of different places. Like, um, you know, I was raised with a mom that said, hey, you can do anything. Uh, you can be anything uh, every day when I left for school. So I kind of always had like a confidence, I think, instilled in me. And I was very lucky since from an early age. But then, you know, it's just like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, um, you can lose it. Um, and, and, and periods of life, it could come and go. So like maybe a freshman at San Diego State coming from a small town, like I, my confidence wasn't as high, but by a senior, I was able to, you know, have more confidence and I've been there before. So I think sure. putting yourself out there allows you to continue to build your confidence. Um, I think having good good people around you that tell you they love you and you are good. You don't need to be anything. I mean, it's, it's so funny. Now I see so many, um, individuals that are posting all the time and, uh, you can, it just like, you can just see the insecurity, uh, in, in their, in their photos, you know, I think, um, and so I, and I think a lot of people will try to overcome confidence by like posting more on Instagram and, sh- and showing that they are actually, um, you know, outgoing and stuff like that. When I actually think that's, it's, it's showing the opposite, you know, the most, the, the, the most uh, cocky guy is the one that never feels like he has to do anything. Now it doesn't mean you, you, you're not proud of things and you post and do all that, but, uh, um, it, to, to really show and, and be confident is just knowing who you are and not needing anyone else. And so, um, not feeling like you have to post for approval. I love that. I think that's super, super powerful. Knowing who you are, I think is is a huge part of it. And again, not trying to compare. It's so easy to compare, even as an entrepreneur. Like I think that's something that maybe is not talked about a ton, but as you enter competition, constantly looking left and right, what other people are doing, while you do need to do that to some degree to learn, you got to stay focused on you know who you are, what you're trying to do, what problems are you solving and how are you bringing value to the people you're serving? Definitely, definitely. I want to talk about team a little bit because I know you, you mentioned earlier, you know, it was four guys. I think you said four guys kind of starting this, getting it going, hustling. Gotcha. Uh, so you being the founder, what did the early days look like from a team perspective? And how did you guys kind of build out, you know, the infrastructure of the brand from a team, you know, standpoint? Yeah, I think this is really important is in the early days, you want to find people who do all separate things. So my first person was an accountant who now runs our finances. The second guy was an operational guy who runs like planning and inventory purchasing. The third guy was one that was good with the camera because, you know, content is so important. And then me, I did the brand in the community out of the gate. And that was so important for us to, to, there was, there wasn't a lot of friction. It was like, Hey, I got this, you got that go. 
And we were really quick. So sometimes founders hire like the, their mini me or, or the someone that's too close to what they do. And I think that can lead to a lot of friction. So, you know, Carter and myself who runs finances, like I just know he's got it. And that, that gives us a lot of peace and it allows us to have, be, uh, have a lot of speed because we're not doing the same thing. And in the early days, that's what's going to make you is just doing separate things. Yeah, it's really good. That's super helpful. And then in terms of scaling and, and kind of building out the team, like what did that process look like for you guys? Was it as the brand just started to make, gain momentum, you just started to kind of bring people in in appropriate roles to to tackle different things? How did that kind of work for y'all? I think I actually think that's some of the things, that's our next phase of, of challenge for cuts. I'm not convinced we have uh, have expert, have, have become experts in like building a team past 60 people. Um, I think we've, we've had our struggles with doing that. Um, I think it's, it's really hard to repl replicate like that early success that we had in a way at a larger scale. And the biggest thing I learned over the last year is like, it's so cliche, but culture matters so much that, and I think culture, I was, I always knew that. And I heard that before, but what it means to me now is that I think people have to see life in the same way they have mm -hmm. to see and it doesn't mean like political affiliations in that it's like, do you believe that like, you know, hard work drives, uh, results? Do you believe like, you know, simple, like, do you want to work from home or do you want to be in the office? Like if, if you have different beliefs there, it's going to create too much friction. Um, do you see like the customer in the same way? Uh, or do you think, do you believe the customers, you know, something different? So I, I think there's a lot of things that can, um, transpire that, in culture that are like, it's easy to say, oh, you should have good culture and, and and just have that statement. But actually knowing what good culture is, is like the, is the next phase and applying that to your business. So like, if I could do a quick summary is like, make sure people like share the same values. Cause that's super important. Make sure they want to work in the same way that you want to work, which I think became a big issue during COVID. Um, Cause you know, there's some work from home organizations that do great work. There's some uh, in person. And I think that's, that's huge because how you work with each other is how you're going to create magic. So making sure everyone's aligned with that is so important when you're building a team and then making sure that you've identified who's going to, who's going to be the leaders of those teams. And it's very clear and concise. Um, you know, cuts always hasn't done that great with organization. The leader has been, hasn't been as like, it's this person. Um, and I think I've learned over the last year, you really need to identify who the leader is to be able to build the business. Yeah, that's so good. And I love that. And I think, you know, one one piece of that that I'd like to dive into deeper and honestly hear your thoughts on is as you talk about culture, you talk about team, you obviously have created, I know you've you've surfaced like there's places you can you guys can improve. And as you continue to grow, there'll be there'll be places where you want to, you know, get better. But getting buy-in from people to like really believe in the mission of cuts, like as a leader, how have you done that? Like you talk about kind of what goes into a good culture, but like from you top down, like how have you truly gotten people to buy in internally within the organization and also create buy-in and attraction from those outside of the brand, like athletes, celebrities that are also wanting to be a part of this Cuts family? In the early days, I think it's important. Like I did 10 vlogs and then I got too busy, but I showed the guys around me, hey, I'm all in. I may not have any money. I may not have any resources, but I am all in. Yeah. Showing people that you're all in for this is so important. That's that's thing number one. Uh Thing number two is just, you know, having, allowing people to come talk to you um, if, with their frustrations. Cause like, if you're very closed up and you, you're hard to approach, it's going to be hard for someone to buy in. Um, so just being approachable, I think is important. Um, and I think another, uh, another big thing is having a big vision. Like I've always said from day one, when cuts had no revenue, I want to build a billion dollar brand. Like people don't want to si sign up for, uh, to work for a business that doesn't have a big vision. Sure. You know, why would, why would you do that? Like, why would you make less money or why would you, you know, take a bet on that? They want to have, we want to work for someone with a big ass vision. So as a founder, I'm always challenging myself to continue to have that. Um, yeah. So I think those are important. Those are huge. Yeah. I think too, you know, what I tell people is like, I really believe like positive energy attracts. And I would say from a brand perspective, you guys have a very positive energy around the brand, like you leading it. And obviously you're a great team pushing just the envelope of constantly trying to innovate and be ambitious and do things that, you know, maybe other brands aren't willing to, or maybe scared to do. And I think that, uh, I think that attracts people. I think there's a level of that where there's uncertainty, 
I think there's a level of that where you don't necessarily have a guaranteed outcome, but you're going towards that outcome. And I think that also just like turns heads and gets people like interested in what you're doing. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah. Positive energy is, is, is so, is so important. Um, yeah, you never, yeah. It's so in countenance, do you know what countenance means? Um, like accountability, like no, having a good countenance, um, uh, countenance is like your facial and emotional, like how you present oh. yourself in a room. Yeah. yeah. Like, a guy that like, when you walk in a room, people are like, Oh, he's, he's happy. He's energetic. Like having a good countenance. It's like your physical appearance of, of, I might be just describing the word wrong, but it's kind of a facial and emotional, uh, opinion when someone walks in the room, like walking into a room with it, uh, being energized and with joy and having a smile on your face. Those are things that really impact the team. And, you know, now with interviews, we hired people cr- during COVID. We didn't see what their smile was like because they on the zoom, they were wearing a mask and then in person. And I think it really hurt our, our organization because wow. like you miss the, the, the things that are not on the resume and th- that that's, that's impacts culture. So, um, yeah, I think now that COVID's over, I'm, I'm I'm happy that you know hiring's getting more is getting better. That's great. That's awesome. You know, another piece to the you know the puzzle that you kind of touched on is something you had your hands in very heavily from the gate, and I'm sure you still do to some degree. Is the community side of the brand? I think this is something that's super interesting. I'd love for you to touch on as you know brands continue to develop in today's age. I think the ones that have a really strong strategy and ability to activate a community beyond just selling the the product, I think do a lot better than others. And I think Cuts has done a great job of formulating that community. What kind of went, you know, into the process of you starting the community from the beginning and kind of growing it to where it is now? Yeah. Uh, it's more simple than people make it. Uh, you know, the guys in here, you know, all, Brennan, Carter, Sean, we were, uh, college graduates that like to play sports, uh, maybe not the best at sports, but we loved being competitive and we like, you know, working out, being healthy, living a healthy lifestyle. And we built a brand around those principles of, of being competitive, have, uh, being great at like taking care of your body or at least trying to, it doesn't mean you're like a perfect gym guy. And you, I have donuts all the time and fries, but I love <laughs> hitting the gym and I love like doing, I love being active, like living an active lifestyle. Yep. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I want to, I want to win at what I do. I want to be competitive. So we went and found people that have that similar mindset uh, that can compete in the sport of business. So just I did being, being able to identify that is, is what makes good and bad ambassador programs or communities, because I think some communities just accept everyone. And then that can lead to like just a bunch of people, but you need a common thread to have success. So, um, and, and, and that's what ours has been. And you've been a part of that. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's like you, you definitely have to have standards. You have to have expectations, but also be like welcoming that you know if you if you're able to come to where we are and meet what's where we are. Like we want to build this thing together, but we have things that we're not that are non negotiable. Like these are the standards. These are the things we live by. These are our principles. Let's go get it, kind of thing. Yeah, I love we're it. Actually, you, uh, our, part of our next ambassador program is going to be uh, because before maybe I shouldn't say this on a podcast, but I think you'll like it. <laughs> uh, is we're going to, uh, uh, we're not, we're not as an application, it's just going to be a video, uh, submission, wow. um, no more like video submission and then your socials obviously, but, uh, we want to, we want to be able to see people how, like see them talk to us and why, what does cuts mean to them and why, why they, sh- why they are going to be a great representation of competing in, and winning in the sport of business just open-ended and, and then they'll, they'll go. And that's going to be our new way to vet it. And uh, I, I think, and it doesn't matter if we're not going to look at follower count or, um, you know, it's all about value and, and that person of how they're great at that, great at that. And I think it's going to lead to a really high quality uh, team starting in August. Dude, that's super unique. I you'll, think- have to, you'll have to get your video ready. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll start start brainstorming that now. I think it's a great idea, man. I think it's cool. And at the end of the day, I think what some brands miss too is that like you're serving and interacting with like real human beings, like they're real people. And when you have the skill, the ability, the talent to decipher, you know, who's going to be a good, real human, real person to bring onto the brand, I think that's a really strong skill that's very overlooked. 
Because at the end of the day, like that's how I think you play the long game and build something that's built on a very strong foundation, not a quick money grab or this guy might be great at sales, but is he the right fit for the brand and the brand image and what we stand for? And will he go represent the brand in the way we want him to? Because he's now or she's now an extension of our principle. Exactly. And and, and we've gotten that wrong at times because we've said, all right, this guy's got a lot of followers. He can sell for us. Yeah. And, And I think that's what. I want like I think in what makes ambassadors look ambassador programs look just like pay for play. Like we we, we want to build a we want to really find guys and girls that are just rock stars of whatever they do um, to represent us. And um, I th- I think we want we really want to take out the sales support of it. Yeah, they wear our clothes and 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 they look good in our clothes, but they're also good uh, muses for our our mission, which is to inspire those to compete and win in the sport of business. I love that, dude. That's that's super helpful, man. I'm I'm in the process right now of building out, mapping out, building out a community portion of um, the brand I own. It's a supplement company, and I'm I'm you know those are these are all things you have to consider. And I think as there's there's like the short like the tunnel of like the short term way to look at, it, and then there's a the long term way to look at. It. And I think you guys are obviously taking the long term approach of what's best for the the brand overall and how it's going to continue to grow and build, not just you know short term. Definitely, definitely. What has been and and you might have a couple that come to mind here. What has been one of your proudest moments so far building this brand? I'm sure you guys, I mean, you guys have activated some incredible, you know, parties and, and different things like that. You've, I'm sure, had certain people, celebrities that you, you've seen wearing the brand. What has been like a really proud moment for you and why? One, so I've had a lot. Um, I think the, the you know, uh, maybe the fourth or fifth year when we for, for really started making money, um, you know, a couple of the guys in here, they were, they started their career here at like 30 K a year, just cause they wanted to be a part of it. And then they all got new leases. And I saw like, you know, they got, had nice cars and it was just a little thing. Like, but I remember being like, wow, cuts actually paid for that in a way. Like, that's pretty cool. Like we, we I remember early on me and Carter would be like, man, just to pay 60 K a year for me and him to be full-time. We're like, we're going to need to sell a lot of shirts. <laughs> I almost seemed unattainable. So just like the little things like that, I was super proud of. Um, you know, creating opportunities for those guys. And now I think they all make pretty good money. And, you know, I, I think I try to, with all, I try not to have two, I think you can have a big vision where the business wants to go. We want to be a billion dollar brand, but your impact on people's lives, I think needs to be small first, then big. Cause when, you, when I meet founders that are like, Hey, I want to change the world, but they're assholes to their employees or assholes to their, their community members. And it's like, well, what's going on here? This seems shallow or short-sighted. So my thing is, and not everyone's going to like me. I'm sure you could look at some glass door raised and be like, what's going on? Steven seems like an asshole. So you get, you know, I'm sure my approach isn't for everyone, but the people that really do stick here, whether it's our community members or the internal employees, I just want to set them up for success later in life. Um, and, And I hope I can be part of that journey in an impactful way. Um, as well as, you know, bless my brothers and sisters and my family members, hopefully long-term where they're taken care of. Um, but you know, my people in my immediate circle, like if, uh, if they could be, have a better impact because of me, that's what would get me really excited. So cool, man. Yeah. It's, it's again, just so cool. I, I just, the, the money's one part of business that I think obviously you have to consider and you have to think about, but just seeing something go from an idea, someone's heart and desire and an idea to really building something that's, you can see it like that to me is just one of the coolest, you know, processes that you can think of. Like, you know, I just think it's so cool to see people put together their minds, their resources, their connections or whatever, and to actually build something tangible. And you've done that in a, in a really cool way. It's awesome. I love it. I appreciate it. Where is where is Cuts headed? I mean, obviously, you guys have a ton of momentum right now. You're a fast growing brand in the space. Where are you guys going? Do you have any goals or any any things that you'd like to share in terms of exciting things you guys are working on or, you know, the direction you're going? Retail is going to be big, I think, for us to, uh, um, you know, bring the brick and mortar. We have a, a long term pop up on Bleecker Street launching next year, which I'm really excited about. So cool. um, and, you know, continue to build that process out. Uh, another thing I'm excited about is our launch of our ambassador 2.0 program, which we're working on right now. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of blew it up in a way to build it back, but I think it's going to be more impactful. Um, and it's going to be more about the mission rather than sales. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. 
Um, and, you know, just another year in business. Like we're way smarter from the inventory. We understand our customer more. Um, you know, I remember at one point I was like, oh, we don't need someone with all this experience, blah, blah, blah. I was the young hotshot that thought he knew everything. But, yeah. um, you know, experience is such a valuable tool. Experience in, in something that you've done for six years, like you can make such much better decisions, um, how to spend cash, how to retain cash, how to grow the business. So just another year I'm really excited for. I'm I'm also excited just to run a business in a normal climate. I think we ran the business in the COVID year, then the post COVID year, which was like the supply chain troubles. Then the last year, which was a recession. I'm just like waiting for a year where it's like no, like one in a hundred year thing that we have to deal with. Cause like, you know, with that, we've been blessed because sales have spiked dramatically through some of these situations, but it's also just been like one craziness after another. So if we can just get to a period of, of just normalcy, I think it'll it'll be like that's when cuts I think will shine the brightest because we built the business the right way. We haven't been a fad, you know. We're, we're seasonless. We don't make products that are uh, come and go. Uh, you know, they're not cheap products either. We we want our shirts to last, totally. and so I think you know we've seen a lot of brands pop up that are just now selling snake oil, and during this crazy time they can have success. I think cuts is moment in the sun is yet to come because mm-hmm. we're just developing a great brand. That's awesome, man. I love it. I, I agree. I completely agree. I'm super curious and, and this probably changes, you know, from time to time, but what does a day in the life look like for you? Um, I think it's always interesting to hear different people's habits and, and kind of the way they structure their things when they're running things, you know, the caliber of cuts. I think it changes every six months. And I think as a business grows as fast as we are, you have a different business every six months in a way. Yeah. So uh, recently, um, you know, it's funny, I was talking to our or another one of our VPs. And I said, you know what, I'm doing too, I'm doing too much of recruiting and some of the admin stuff uh, and onboarding. I want you to take it and just let me focus on product and, and community for the next six months. And then we'll retouch it six months. And I think the way I work is like SOPs and, and people's job descriptions can change in six months because things change in our business. And oh. that's cause frustration for certain employees. They like to have more of a consistent SOP um, so I, I think for, for me on a daily basis, I, I, you know, I wake up early, I go to the gym, uh, I get to the office around eight and, uh, you know, try to crush my emails and answer people from the previous day that need a, need an answer to move forward. And then I, um, I spend time in product and go over, okay, the product mobile, what are, cause there's always, there's always the next deadline, um, try to, you know, wear products and then. Recently, I've been rebuilding our our community approach, uh, meeting with the the individuals to run that. Um, and then at the end of the day, I usually go over new business, new things that come about with our VPs um, and try to spend time with them. So it, it, it changes. I think in summary, the role of a CEO is to be like a chameleon in a way. Mm-hmm. Like you never know what you what hat you need to pull. You need to know just enough to get it to the person that knows more than you. Uh, and you got to have a good feel for the business. What's the, what's the general feel? Like, where are we at? Like, are we, ha- do we have momentum? Do we not have momentum? Um, and I think you, you, the, the, the founder's gut in developing that is usually what makes a great in business and a bad business. Like for right now, if, um, uh, you know, the biggest times we've had failures is when I haven't followed my gut. And so I think like more and more, I'm just saying, nope, we're not doing that. Because I, it may not make sense to the rest of the organization, but I know um, it's not right. I love that. That's super, super cool. I like how you compare it to a chameleon. I think that's pretty, that's pretty interesting way to do that. Yeah. Um, do you have any hobbies outside of business? What, what do you like to do when you try to just relax or disengage? I like to go on runs. I go on like a seven mile run, a, a trail run on Saturday mornings, like almost every Saturday. I've done it 65 times in the last, I've almost done it once a week, like you know, in the last year, maybe, more, maybe slightly more than 55 times or slightly more than one, uh, once a week. Uh, and then hang out with my family. Uh, I'm a big family guy. You know, I have a small group of friends, so I like to hang out with them when in LA. Watch sports, um, you know, spike ball, volleyball, those things in the summer. I just like to get out and active if, if I'm not in the office. But I, my hobby is cuts. I love it. I love it. I can tell. So that's <laughs> uh, that's my hobby. 
That's so cool, man. Dude, this has been such a fun interview and I'm I'm super, super thankful for you and all you've done and, and just your time to take this because I know you're super busy. But last question I have for you as we wrap this up, one piece of advice that you would give to a young entrepreneur from you know something you've learned from your journey from where you started to hustling, trying to get a t-shirt to market to now running a super successful business with momentum to continue to scale. One piece of advice. Um, understand that this is my newest one. So I said it at a, 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 a panel I did yesterday, but understand the season that you're in. And this is the biggest lesson for us. Like in previous years, we've tried to grow month over month and, and spend growth month over month. And sometimes seasons are telling you, hey, it's actually not time to push it. Work on the mechanics. Then there's seasons like, hey, you got to go all in. You need to go and go, 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 go and spend, spend, spend and, and grow, grow, grow. I think understanding the season that you're in will allow you to be most efficient. And then if you zoom out and pluck yourself out, you'll then realize uh, that you didn't slow down. You just, you grew in a different pace, which is the most efficient pace rather than just like fighting the fight and, you know, hitting that brick wall when it's not working. You need to under identify when those phases are so you can be most efficient. And that looks, that's like, doesn't matter what stage of your business in, you know, early on for cuts, we, launched our website and our product we spent on Facebook ads and we lost $6,000 didn't get a single sale. I had to then stop Facebook ads, stop growth and just focus on the website and the imagery. Then when we turned it on, we were able to grow again. So that was an example of understanding the moment and understanding the phase that, hey, it's not a, it's not a spend period. Focus on the website so you can get it good enough to be able to be successful. Um, you know, recently, uh, you know, Q1 is always a slow period, but I'm like, screw Q1. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to ramp up in Q1. That's not a good way to run your business after Q4. Save that budget and do, do even more in August or towards the end of the year when people are buying. Um, so I think understanding the season that you're in can lead to the most success. Um, and it's something that I don't, I don't think gets talked about enough. That's a wise answer. That's a, that's a vet answer right there. Cause it sounds like when you're getting going, you're young, you're just like, I want to go, 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 go. But sometimes you got to change speeds, change directions, slow it down, you know, be strategic and you know, where you push the gas. It's like when Kyrie does that hezzy, you know, that, 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 that <laughs> pause allows him to get that bigger burst. But I, if he was just running up and down the court, he would, he, he he's not going to, he's not going to catch up. To, he's not going to get by anyone. Cause it's just, it, it's, it's just not going to be as, Swagger. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but I, I was going to use Tyler Hero, but I guess Kyrie works too, man. I was going to. Use- I, I, I I love Tyler Hero. He he works. Ky- Ky- <laughs> exactly, bro. Thank you so much, Stephen. This has been so dope. I'm so thankful, and uh, man, congrats what you're doing. Continue to kill it, and this has been a great episode of the AIM Podcast. Love it, bro. Good luck to you. Let's go.